So this is the Vanderbilt Perioperative Medicine uh, Seminar Series. I'm excited for two things. Uh, I'm going to start with the latter first, which is uh, we're going to keep doing this, what we're doing today with Dr. Raymond uh, and what we've had the past couple of weeks between Dr. Andy Shaw and Jeffrey Simmons. So please join us. We're off next week, but the following week uh, with um, Dr. Weiji Sundra, uh, Sundra who uh, there's actually a I think a misspelling there. It's D-E-R-A. Um, but he is from University of Toronto. If you read anything in the cardiac biomarker space, you'll realize that uh, he's a really big name. and going to be talking about cardiac risk assessment uh, using scoring systems and cardiac biomarkers, which, as you know, on the periop service uh, and in high-rise clinic are a big topic of discussion. Um, but without further ado, what I want to do today is introduce a friend and colleague, um, I would like to say a mentee, but that's only because I'm older than her, not because I have anything to offer, um, but Brittany Raymond, who, um, for those of you outside of Vanderbilt, she uh, did her residency at Vanderbilt, did a fellowship in obstetric anesthesia at Vanderbilt, was also um, outstanding in her time uh, when she worked on our perioperative medicine services as a resident and has joined uh, as an attending on our perioperative consult service and also in our high rise or high risk surgical encounter clinic. Um, and somehow she made me quit sharing and she was able to share as I was doing that. Um, so Brittany is uh, phenomenally bright, has the most energy of any human that I know. And um, so she's going to be talking about perioperative nutrition and thinking about how do we, uh, how do we think about energy and nutrition in the perioperative period? Um, and how do we maybe have something that we isn't very interesting, particularly if um, you're an anesthesia care provider uh, on the call that uh, we all want to induce people with severe pulmonary hypertension or peripartum cardiomyopathy or something like that. And this this seems a bit mundane, but hopefully by the end of it, she uh, I'm sure will have convinced you that uh, we've overlooked this for far too long. So without any further ado, uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Raymond. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, this will definitely be less than an hour, so hopefully some good time for uh, some discussion. Uh, as Dr. McAvoy said, I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt, where I spend about half of my clinical time practicing perioperative medicine in both the inpatient space, but also in our high-risk pre-op clinic. Uh, and today, we're going to be discussing one of my favorite interventions in the pre-op clinic, which is the optimi optimization of nutrition status. All right, so we're going to start our journey by exploring the prevalence of malnutrition in our surgical population. We're going to learn how to define it, how to identify it, and what to do about it. Next, we're going to spend a little bit more time focusing on one aspect of the proposed interventions, which is something called immunonutrition. We're going to learn how it differs from other sources of oral nutrition supplements and then explore what the evidence is behind it. And then for the last half of the presentation, we're going to focus on the unique roles that vitamin C and D play in the perioperative period. I realize that there's a variety of different nutrients that we could discuss, anything from riboflavins to uh, folate and B12, et cetera, but I'm just going to focus on vitamin C and D today. Um, full disclosure. I am probably not the best person to be talking to you about nutrition. Um, I have had seven diet sodas already today, working on my eighth. Um, and I'm also probably the only person that gained weight when I tried to be a vegan because all I did was eat carbs instead of vegetables. But anyway, um, I will be mentioning a couple brands of amino nutrition today. I want to be clear that I do not have any financial stake in these companies. I've never talked to a representative from these companies, and I've never even tasted one of their shakes. Um, these are just simply the two brands that I'm most familiar with because we utilize them at my institution. All right, so let's start by defining the problem. It's certainly a big one. So malnutrition, as you know, it describes a state of nutrient deficiency. It's either inadequate intake or, which is most common in surgical population, especially GI, the inability to absorb or use your ingested nutrients. And unfortunately, malnutrition is fairly prevalent among surgical populations. In fact, approximately 50% <laughs> of your surgery patients are gonna meet criteria for malnourishment. And this incidence is even higher among the GI and oncology populations where every two of three patients meets criteria for malnourishment, but it gets worse. 
of these patients, only 10% are ever identified and even less receive treatment for it. But there is some good news because nutrition is coming more into the spotlight, at least in the last decade, um, as hospital systems and payers are embracing bundled payments and really prompting a shift towards looking at improving surgical outcomes, to which nutrition is heavily tied. So we're going to look at that specifically now. So data from ACS Nisquip has identified malnutrition as one of the only major readily modifiable risk factors that is associated with poor surgical outcomes. Data is fairly consistent that being malnourished at the time of surgery is associated with a double increase in the need for operation, threefold increase for readmission, fourfold for having a serious complication or even mortality, and as you might expect, a very high risk of wound breakdown and infection. So from a financial perspective, the increased complications and length of stay absolutely cannot be understated. We as perioperative providers have the opportunity to make a really substantial difference, uh, not only in patient outcomes, but also for institutional gains. Because for every dollar that you invest on optimizing your patient's nutrition, you're going to save your hospital 52. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you that it is a big problem. Now, how are you going to screen for it in your patients? Thankfully, it's as easy as one, two, three. So in 2018, the uh, American Society for Enhanced Recovery, or ASER, introduced and proposed a preoperative screening tool for malnutrition called PONS. PONS stands for Pre-Op Nutrition Screening, and it's quick, it's very easy to use, it's designed to be administered by any clinic staff, not just physicians, um, and it asks three simple questions. Number one, does your patient have a low BMI? Number two, have they experienced any recent weight loss? Or number three, have they had a reduced appetite within the last week? If they answer positively to any of these three questions, they are considered to screen positive and therefore at risk for malnutrition. Alternatively, if their albumin is less than three, they also automatically screen positive. Now, historically, low albumin levels have been utilized as an objective marker for malnutrition, but both Azer and Pokey recognize that this is actually not the most optimal biomarker to use. However, it is the one that's most frequently available in the patient's chart, often drawn on routine labs. But if you want to be even more intentional and specific about identifying malnutrition, a 2017 meta-analysis of biomarkers that were associated with malnutrition found that total serum protein was actually more useful. Um, it performed just as well as albumin, but it was much less sensitive to acute stressors and inflammation, which is going to make it particularly uh, useful in the surgical population. All right, so what do you do about a positive screen? Well, ASER recommends two options. The first, any patient that screens at risk for malnutrition should ideally be referred to a nutritionist or a dietitian. Um, we do have a working relationship with the nutritionists at my institution where we have a, uh, their pager number. And when we have a positive screen in clinic, they will physically come down and see the patient for an in-person consult while they're here. Um, unfortunately, if they're busy or if they're rounding, unavailable, they will set up the patient for a telemed consult. In situations where referrals to a dietitian or nutritionist is not possible, the recommendation is for oral nutrition supplements for seven days. And this can come in many forms, but the easiest is going to be those already pre-made, pre-mixed protein shakes. And protein supplementation is going to be of much more benefit than just overall calorie consumption. You're going to want to look for whey and casein protein, um, which are the best quality for promoting muscle synthesis. And for a stressed or surgical patient, you want to aim for them consuming one to two grams of protein per kilo per day. Um, and you want to divide that into multiple doses because there's actually a ceiling effect for how much your um, body can maximally process at one time. So anything above 30 grams at one time or at one meal, your body's not going to get any additional benefit above and beyond in terms of muscle synthesis. 
Now, conveniently, nearly all shakes that are on the market do follow this rule already. And there's about 30 grams of protein per carton, no matter which brand you pick. So let's say your little malnourished oncology patient is around 50 kilos. Her goal is going to be 100 grams of protein per day. And so you're going to advise her to drink about three shakes per day. Please remind your patients that these shakes are in addition to their diet, not a meal replacement. They may need some encouragement. You will often encounter patients that are going to balk at the idea of having to consume three shakes plus all their meals because they're struggling with their appetite at baseline. But if you can encourage them to do this for just seven days, you can reduce perioperative morbidity by up to 50%. And if those results impress you, let's talk about an even better option called immunonutrition. It's essentially a protein shake that was designed with the specific needs of surgical patients. So think of it kind of like a surgical grade or prescription level protein shake, because can, in contrast to the regular brands that are available kind of you know, on the supermarket shelves or at CVS, these amino nutrition shakes, like their name implies, actually improve the function of your immune system to improve your surgical outcomes. It does this by blending um, arginine, some omega fatty acids, and antioxidants. Arginine is imperative to activate your T lymphocytes and for phagocytosis. Um, arginine is also imperative for the production of nitric oxide and proline, which are going to improve your blood flow to your anastomotic sites. It's also going to improve uh, wound healing. On the flip side, the omega fatty acids and the antioxidants are going to play a role in reducing the oxidative stress in your inflammation. And while this all sounds fairly plausible, uh, when it comes to an amino nutrition shake, which is going to be twice the cost of just a regular protein shake, what is the objective evidence for its benefit? Some of the earliest data comes from the 1990s out of Dr. Braga's group working with Novartis, who would then later go on and sell their immune nutrition, immune nutrition drink under the trade name Impact. So Dr. Braga's group, knowing that surgical stress was associated with a very sharp decline in arginine, as well as a sharp decline in the responsiveness of your immune system in the immediate postoperative period, they put together a drinkable nutrition supplement that was rich in arginine, fatty acids, and nucleotides. They then performed an RCT with surgical patients to investigate the impact, pun is intended, on gut microperfusion and then the function of the immune system. And it was a small study, just 40 patients. Uh, they were randomized to a week of both pre and post-op nutrition, either using their unique formula or a control protein drink that had an equivalent amount of calories. So what did they find? First, we're gonna look at the gut perfusion. So intraoperatively, surgeons used a Doppler to measure the blood flow to the gut of both the small and the large bowel. What they found was that blood flow was significantly higher in the supplemental group at both the beginning and at the end of surgery. But what they thought was even more remarkable was that even with the known reduction in blood flow that you do get at the end of surgery, the blood flow in the supplemented group was actually um, higher than the baseline coming in blood flow for the control group. Um, and then these results were also replicated and also statistically significant in the colon as well. Regarding immune function, they looked at the function of PMNs or like polymorphonuclear cells, I believe, uh, through their capacity for phagocytosis. And preoperatively, there was a small but insignificant increase in both groups, as you might expect when you're providing a week of a nutrition drink. However, the biggest difference came postoperatively, where we typically see a sharp decline in immune function. Um, and you can see that this did occur in the control group, whereas with the supplemented group, the ability for phagocytosis was relatively preserved at the baseline levels. And don't forget, just because they label it as supplement versus control, the control group was not just water or just Gatorade. It was actually a protein drink that was isocaloric to the supplement that they invented. And with these promising results, they wanted to know, well, if we can improve blood flow to the gut and we can improve the function of our immune system, how does that translate to actual clinical outcomes?
So in this phase three trial, they repeated the same design, this time with 206 patients. Again, it was their formula versus an isoenergetic, isonitrogenous control. So some type of protein drink that had the same amount of calories and the same amount of protein as their formulation. Um, so seven days pre, seven days post, they looked at a variety of different possible infections, anything from wound infections, pneumonias, UTIs, et cetera. And they found that by drinking their impact formulation, there is a 50% relative reduction in the risk of developing an infectious complication. Furthermore, of those who did go on to develop an infection, it was clinically less severe, which was represented by a reduction in the duration of antibiotic therapy by about two days. And those patients actually were discharged earlier by almost two days compared to the control group. They also took it one step for further and performed a post-hoc analysis to see if the impact of impact, again, pun intended, differed based upon the nutritional status of the patient. So they broke their patients up into two different groups and identified a group that qualified for malnourishment, which they defined as a decrease in body weight of over 10% uh, preoperatively. And in summary, the authors found that their nutrition supplement was effective at reducing infectious complications, regardless of the baseline nutrition status. So their main message here was that even if you're well-nourished and healthy going into surgery, you still are going to see benefit from their immunonutrition drink. As you might imagine, with these types of promising results, their impact formulation began to be used in a variety of different RCTs, um, enough so that in 2006, a group actually performed a meta-analysis comparing them all. Um, they included studies that were prospective RCTs of major elective surgery who reported outcomes on infection and length of stay and where the intervention was the impact formula specifically. They found 17 trials that encompassed over 2,000 patients, 10 of which um, the impact was administered both pre and post-op, and then seven of which it was just a post-op administration. Um, and then of the 17 studies, 10 of them were uh, having the same control group, which was an isocaloric and isonitrogenous protein drink. So what did they find in terms of infectious complications overall? The uh, perioperative period was associated with a significant reduction in nearly all infectious complications by about half. Additionally, length of stay was also reduced by an average of two days. Furthermore, they had enough data that they could actually do a subgroup analysis and determined that the results were most profound for GI surgery, where they hypothesized that the preservation of the gut micro microcirculation um, was imperative to preserving the integrity of um, the anastomosis and it prevented the breakdown. Um, but then they also found that there was better results and outcomes for administering impact pre-operatively rather than just post-operatively alone. With the hypothesis that you're providing a better physiologic reserve on the, on the front end, which allows you to mount that immune response immediately post-op. Um, from the data that I've shown you so far, uh, the caveat here is that this is only data for the impact brand. Now, 17 years later, there's a variety of different immunonutrition brands on the market, along with many more RCTs and subsequent meta-analyses. And if you're interested in a good summary of that literature, I would encourage you to review Azer's consensus statement on perioperative nutrition. They have a um, section of that manuscript that specifically summarizes the data regarding immunonutrition. Uh, they call one of the articles to be landmark. It was a meta-analysis by Drover and colleagues, which was not just limited to impact, but looked at any brand of immunonutrition drink. They found 35 studies that qualified and also showed a 50% reduction in infection and also a two-day length of stay reduction. Now, going back to our main message, let's review the recommendations by Azer. So you can either refer to a nutritionist or you begin or could begin oral supplementation empirically for about one week. You can do, you know, regular off the shelf, whatever's on sale at your grocery store brand shape. 
brand protein shake, or you could step it up with an amino nutrition shake. Um, these amino nutrition shakes are available online via Amazon or walmart.com. You could also theoretically write a prescription for it. They can take it to their pharmacy and the pharmacy can order it for them. Despite it being a prescription, it's not currently covered by insurance. It may be covered by FSA. I'm not quite sure. Um, a week's worth of supply runs anywhere between $50 to $70. Um, and I'm also going to discuss another option C, which is not currently mentioned in Azer's recommendations, but I do think it's important to touch on. And that is, is there the ability to improve your patient's appetite? So cannabinoids have been approved to uh, stimulate appetites among patients with HIV specifically, but there tends to be a clinical crossover where providers are trying to use it for cachexia and cancer in surgical patients as well. There are three main classes of cannabinoids. The first is endogenous. Those are the ones that your body produces itself. Um, they act at the cannabinoid, cannabinoid 1 and 2 receptors, with CB1 being the most prevalent one in the nervous system. The second class is going to be the phytocannabinoids. These are what is produced by the cannabis plant, but they are so molecularly similar to what we produce endogenously that they actually have the ability to bind to those same CB1 and CB2 receptors. And the two most common forms are what we know as the THC and CBD with the CBD being associated with less cognitive effects. Um, synthetic cannabinoids are our attempt to manufacture or mimic the phytomolecules. So the two formulations that are available in the US are dronabinol or marinol, which is approved to treat cachexia, as I said, in HIV patients. Nabilone or sesamet, I believe is how it's pronounced, is... Um, has better bioavailability than Marinol, but um, also a longer duration of action. However, instead of being used primarily to promote appetite stimulation, it's actually indicated for the treatment of nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. It is important to note that if you prescribe either one of these medications to your patients preoperatively, it will uh, show up positive on a drug screen because both are synthetic versions of THC. So why does this work? Well, the primary method of action is likely the theory that it's going to activate or promote the orosensory reward pathway, which is going to increase your sense of pleasure or enjoyment with eating. Um, another postulation is that because it is known to decrease the severity of symptoms of anxiety and depression, it may contribute to battling cachexia or anorexia with these conditions. And then lastly, for some reason, the CB1 receptor, if you block that, it induces nausea and vomiting. So if you were to agonize it, that potentially could decrease nausea and thus promote your appetite. So does it work? Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, 2016, the European Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or ESPN, uh, published their recommendations and stated, quote, there are is insufficient or consistent clinical data to recommend cannabinoids. So in 2021, this group uh, performed a more updated review of the, letter, of the literature, especially because it became more popular in the most recent years. And the purpose of their review was to evaluate cannabinoid use for the treatment of anorexia, specifically among um, adult patients with cancer. What they found is that the data is still very sparse. They were only able to identify six placebo RCTs, most of which were very small. Of the six, two looked at Marinol, two uh, Sesamit, and then two looking at either THC or CBD extracts. So it's even more difficult to draw conclusions as the interventions were all different, doses were different, and treatment ranges anywhere from two to 11 weeks. Well, what did they find? Well, in terms of outcome, uh, only one of the six studies that looked at appetite found that cannabinoids improved it. And the way that they measured this was it was similar to like a visual analog scale for pain, sort of similar that patients reported their appetite level. For the one that did show a positive correlation, it was the smallest study, it was actually a pilot study. For other studies that looked at oral intake, uh, there were two, neither one showed any 
increase in oral intake. However, one study showed a predisposition to eat more carbs than usual, while the other one um, showed a predisposition to eat more protein. So although it may not increase your oral intake, it may change what the patient is craving, you know, carbs or proteins rather than fats, potentially. For the four studies that looked at weight gain, none endorsed any significant weight gain. And for the five that looked at uh, quality of life, they also found no difference. So in summary, the authors of this systematic review uh, agreed with ESPN and said that there was insufficient data to suggest that they update their original guidelines from 2016. That being said, um, I have prescribed uh, Marinol to several patients in my clinic who subjectively report uh, such a positive improvement that they actually contact me for a refill of that medication. Um, but, you know, placebo effect is, is high. So I'm, I'm not really sure where I fall on that just yet. All right. So hopefully by now we're about halfway through, I've convinced you of three things. Number one, malnutrition is highly prevalent in your surgical population and it's easy to screen for. Number two, Malnutrition is associated with significant morbidity, morbidity, but thankfully it's easily modifiable. Just seven days of a nutrition supplement can make a huge difference. Um, and three, that immunonutrition shakes offer advantages above and beyond what you can get from a traditional protein shake. They specifically modulate your immune system and improve your blood flow, which both are gonna promote better surgical outcomes. So for the latter half of the presentation, we're gonna discuss the specific and unique roles of vitamin C and D. We'll go alphabetically. We'll start with vitamin C and we're gonna start with a fun history lesson. So scurvy, which is the ultimate presentation of vitamin C deficiency, was first documented as far back as ancient Egypt 3,500 years ago. Uh, but it didn't really become a huge problem until the early modern era when sailing became more popular. In fact, sailors uh, more often died of scurvy than in wartime. So for every crew that you had, you would lose about two thirds of that crew to scurvy. And the link between citrus fruits and scurvy was found incidentally in the 1600s by Captain McCaster. He had four ships in his fleet in the Indonesian islands. And one of the four made a stop at an island that had citrus fruits. So they were able to sweeten their tea with lemon. And what do you give sick people back then? Tea. As you can see in the background of this slide, a gentleman is offering a sick sailor a cup of tea. Uh, and Captain Lacaster made the observation that this was the only ship of his fleet that did not suffer from scurvy. And so he made the link that it must have been the lemons that they're adding to their tea, which is pretty sweet. Literally. All right, so let's look at the different roles of vitamin C. So we all know it's got antioxidant properties. It scavenges free radicals. It plays a role in cancer, apoptosis. It's also a powerful anti-inflammatory. Studies show that administering vitamin C can reduce your circulating CRP and inflammatory markers by up to 50%. Endothelial dysfunction occurs over time due to free radicals and stress which then is gonna prevent your blood vessels from producing nitric oxide and being able to vasodilate. Vitamin C can repair or prevent this dysfunction, improving the microcirculation. Um, an obvious role for vitamin C is that it's a cofactor in a variety of different immune cells, particularly phagocytes, where it's gonna generate a reactive oxygen species in order to kill a microbe. Platelets store high concentrations of vitamin C and that helps balance its aggregation. For iron metabolism, vitamin C plays a critical role. So in order for you to absorb oral iron from the gut, you have to convert it from ferric to ferrous form and vitamin C is what manages that reaction. So if you're deficient in vitamin C, you're also likely deficient in iron. And in fact, it is recommended that you take your iron supplement with orange juice or with a vitamin C supplement to help promote absorption. Lastly, I'm gonna convince you that vitamin C plays a role in analgesia. How? Let's take a look. So the link between analgesia and vitamin C was first 
suggested through observations of pain with scurvy. So scurvy is an incredibly painful condition with severe myalgias, musculoskeletal pain, joint pain, sometimes so severe that people can't walk. And when you replace the vitamin C, pain resolves. So it got people thinking that there must be some relationship with vitamin C and pain since you are, if you're severely deficient in it, it manifests with widespread pain. So I'm going to propose to you five different mechanisms how vitamin C might affect your perception of pain. So first, we already discussed that it is a anti-inflammatory. However, you might be surprised to learn that vitamin C also inhibits the binding of glutamate to the NMDA receptor. It's also involved in the production of monoamine neurotransmitters. In fact, the nervous tissue where these are synthesized contains the highest concentration of vitamin C in your body. Endomorphin-1 is the most potent and powerful endogenous uh, opioid that we produce. And vitamin C, which is indicated by the AA or ascorbic acid, is a cofactor in its production. And then lastly, vitamin C is also a cofactor in the production of calcitonin, which is a regulator of serum calcium and can help treat bone pain, especially with metastases. So I've given you five plausible methods on how vitamin C might produce analgesia. It functions like ibuprofen, like ketamine or methadone, like antidepressants and MAOIs and TCAs, functions like opioids, and like calcitonin. Uh, but how effective is it? Let's take a look. So historically, vitamin C has been used with some success, particularly in orthopedic literature. As you might guess, it plays a large role in rheumatoid arthritis compared to osteo due to its anti-inflammatory properties. In fact, if you measure the amount of vitamin C that's in arthritic patients, rheumatoid patients have about half the levels of vitamin C compared to their osteoarthritic arthritic, uh, counterparts. I thought this was pretty impressive. There's also data to suggest that administration of vitamin C is associated with a reduction in the development of CRPS by about half. And there are several different meta-analyses that all report the same result. I'm just referencing the most recent one here that looked at the administration of vitamin C after wrist fractures. Uh, being deficient in vitamin C at the time that you develop shingles is associated with a 21 times greater odds of developing post herpetic neuralgia. Wow. If I ever get that, you better believe I'm taking vitamin C. Um, and lastly, there may be a role in cancer pain. So that's often related to metastatic bone pain, which we already discussed, vitamin C and the role of uh, being a cofactor with calcitonin. Uh, these two studies that I reference here looked at patients undergoing chemotherapy or radiation for cancer and administered vitamin C. And they found that it improved their subjective quality of life. It improved uh, objective measures of functional recovery. It also decreased the side effects associated with their chemo, like nausea. And importantly, it decreased their perception of pain by about 30%. So keep that 30% figure in mind because you're going to see it again. I think that we can all agree that acute surgical pain is a much different beast than chronic painful conditions. So how effective is vitamin C going to be in our surgical population? Well, I would argue that our surgical population is set up to benefit the most from vitamin C. So we know that trauma, surgery, infection, cancer, sepsis, all of these hypermetabolic states that we regular, regularly see in our surgical populations will utilize and deplete their stores of vitamin C. So I'm showing you empty shelves or an empty stores of vitamin C because I want you to remember this point. So patients that have normal levels of vitamin C going into surgery are often going to be deficient if you redraw those levels postoperatively. So theoretically, vitamin C administration may be most beneficial in this population. In 2020, a meta-analysis came out that looked at this very particular question. So vitamin C use in surgical pain. Uh, the authors included RCTs of adult surgical patients who were given vitamin C, either oral or intravenous route, um, as the intervention group. And that was important because the authors reported that oftentimes vitamin C was actually used as the placebo against something else. And so they excluded those and only looked at vitamin C as the intervention. 
their primary outcome was going to be opioid consumption in terms of in terms of MMEs. Um, but knowing that vitamin C has antithrombotic properties, they also looked at blood loss. And knowing the data that it is able to reduce nausea, they looked at um, or nausea with chemotherapy, they looked at the rates of PONV um, as a secondary outcome as well. So what did they find? Well, they screened 233 trials and were able to find about seven RCTs that encompassed over 200 patients, mostly laparoscopic and abdominal, abdominal surgeries, but there was one ENT. Um, of the seven trials that they found, five administered vitamin C through an intravenous route. Two gave it orally. And nearly all of the studies had just a one-time single dose of vitamin C. So hopefully you can see the slide here if you're not on your phone. But for example, under time of administration, they gave it as a one-time administration 30 minutes before the onset of surgery or BOS or after the AI, which means anesthesia induction. So most of the studies, only one looked at giving repeated doses. That was the moon 2000, 2019, but the rest of them, it was a one-time single dose of vitamin C. So let's look at what they found. So oh, actually, before we go on to that, I do want to mention um, they used a fairly clean and objective way to look at their primary outcome, which was MMEs. Nearly all of the studies um, had a PCA for pain management, um, which is a fairly consistent and clean way to get that data. All right, so in terms of pain severity, this is a secondary outcome, the visual analog scores. They looked at the immediate post-op period in the recovery room, as well as later. They separated out the data where um, if the vitamin C was administered orally, that's gonna be up on the top compared to the intravenous route at the bottom. Um, and you can see immediately in the PACU period, the oral route was not effective. That makes sense. Your body probably needs time to absorb it or you placed an NG tube and you sucked it out. Now, if um, the intravenous group absolutely uh, definitely favored vitamin C and it was strong enough to pull the entire weight over. Uh, when looking at delayed, looking at six hours plus, you can now see that the oral route has reached statistical significance being to the left of the bar as well as intravenous. So yes, Subjectively, through visual analog scores, a single administration of vitamin C can reduce your perception of pain in the post-operative period. Let's look at that a little bit more objectively. So their primary outcome was MMEs. So again, the top reflects oral. Not all studies looked at MME consumption all the way out to 48 hours. So you will see as we get along further in time, there's less and less studies available to look at. But as you can see in the immediate post-operative period, again, oral administration was not effective, but IV was um, by about a 30% reduction. At the 24 hour mark, now the oral administration is starting to show a modest effect. And of course, IV is still showing an effect overall about a 30% reduction. And at 48 hours, these were both intravenous routes, again, about a 30% reduction in total MME use. For little old, over-the-counter, vitamin C, that's not bad. In terms of their secondary outcomes, they were unable to determine a difference in EBL. And although nausea was decreased in the PACU, it, there really was no effect postoperatively, maybe because they weren't using that many opioids. Who knows? All right, so we're going to end our journey of vitamin C, and we're going to head on into the realm of vitamin D. I hope that that was some good food for thought, again, pun intended. Hopefully you learned something new about vitamin C that you didn't know before, or that you are at least inspired to think more about its role in your surgical patients. All right, so vitamin D, we'll start with the metabolism. I know it's boring, but it is important. There's two ways that your body can get the precursor for it, either from the sun or from your diet. And it's important for you to know that 80 to 90% of your vitamin D source is actually sunlight. So diet is a very small amount of the source of vitamin D for you. So could be an excuse to go tanning this weekend. 
Um, you may have heard the terms for vitamin D2 and D3, which are identified in the red. I'm not going to try and pronounce those. But basically, these get metabolized in the liver to the pre-hormone, which is 25-hydroxyvitamin D3, which is then converted by the kidneys to the active hormone, which is known as calcitriol. So the main reason I'm showing you this is to have two main points. Number one, most of your source comes from the sun. And secondary, uh, or second, you do need a functioning liver and kidney to metabolize vitamin D appropriately. Because that was boring, I'm going to re-engage you in this presentation by having a little break for a fun fact. So if you were to guess how much more sunlight is required by dark-skinned people to produce an equivalent amount of vitamin D as light-skinned people. So think in your head, if you were to guess, the answer is six times. So they need six times more sun exposure than light-skinned people. All right, so we all know that vitamin D is important for calcium regulation in the body, but it also affects other organ systems too. So starting with neuro, there's data to suggest that if you are deficient in vitamin D at the time that you have an ischemic insult or a stroke, the area of infarct is gonna be much larger. Vitamin D is also associated with a higher incidence of schizophrenia. And there's even newer data suggesting a link between vitamin D D deficiency and delirium, although sorry, I don't have a reference or PubMed ID listed here. From a cardiac perspective, just three weeks of vitamin D administration to somebody with hypertension can lower their systolic and diastolic blood pressure by about 10%. It does this through suppressing the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone uh, system. Vitamin D is also kind of similar to vitamin C in that it preserves endothelial function and promotes the production of nitric oxide. Um, there is an inverse relationship between obesity and vitamin D levels. So in fact, obese women have lower levels of vitamin D than those that are thin but have a diet, dietary deficiency. Um, vitamin D is necessary to inhibit the maturation of adipocytes and has been shown to decrease triglycerides by about 50%. If you supplement a diabetic person with vitamin D for six months, you can reduce their A1C by a full percentage point. Um, like vitamin C, vitamin D also plays a role in reducing uh, inflammatory markers, which may be relevant for cancer suppression and recurrence. Uh, but unique to vitamin D is its correlation with uh, MS. So you may recall that the highest prevalence of MS in the United States is in the Northeast, specifically New York. Um, and oftentimes those patients find themselves moving south and they're not really sure why, they just feel better. Um, one proposed mechanism could be that the lack of sunlight and therefore vitamin D deficiency results in more frequent flares. And so they feel better when they move down to the south and remember, I told you that 80 to 90% of vitamin D comes from sunshine. So knowing that it affects all these different organ systems, let's look at its role in the perioperative period. So we're going to talk about uh, this one systemic or systematic review that screened for studies that reported serum vitamin D levels before and after surgery, and then also reported surgical outcomes. They were able to identify 31 studies, 18 of which were prospective RCTs. Since the plasma half-life of vitamin D is about three weeks, they included studies that reported serum levels as far out as 12 weeks before and 12 weeks after. But the vast majority of these studies, 24 out of 31, reported serum levels within a two-week timeline from around the time of surgery. Um, and then as most studies reported vitamin D deficiency as categorical, you were either deficient or you were not based upon the author's definition. Um, these authors of the systematic review were unable to make conclusions regarding the severity of deficiency and perioperative outcomes. So overall, the authors report that in 84% of studies, vitamin D deficiency perioperatively was associated with a worse surgical outcome. They state, and I quote, in fact, most accounts, the clinical significance of low perioperative vitamin D is substantial. And they go on to group some studies together that looked at um, similar outcomes. So for example, the studies that looked at lung transplant, vitamin D deficiency was associated with three times the risk of rejection 
five times the risk of mortality. For kidney surgeries, low vitamin D was associated with an increased rate of cancer recurrence, which was approximately 8% for each point you were deficient. Uh, kidney transplants were associated with an eight times risk of graft failure. And overall, the increased rate of perioperative infections was about fourfold. So what did the authors take away from all this? Well, first, they noted that no studies were performed prior to 2008. So perioperative nutrition was really not a focus until fairly recently, so literature is more recent. Second, these studies reported a very high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency perioperatively. So it ranged between 50 to 80% of the surgical populations uh, presented with vitamin D deficiency at the time of their surgery. And if these adverse outcomes are to be believed, this amounts to a lot of preventable morbidity. Next, they were able to conclude that being deficient at the time of surgery is associated with worse outcomes than if you were deficient only postoperatively. And to me, this intuitively makes sense because you need the stores as a reserve. So authors recommended that vitamin D supplementation occur preoperatively rather than as a post-op intervention. And lastly, authors noted that although we know the appropriate and optimum levels of vitamin D that you need for just routine regular health, we actually don't know if this threshold is different for surgical patients. It may mean that we need to target an even higher serum level for our patients going into surgery. And with that, we'll conclude a little early, but I'm going to recap what we've learned and discussed today. So first, we talked about malnutrition, how it's highly prevalent in your surgical patients. Up to 50% of your surgical patients are going to be malnourished. But fear not, you can identify it easily by just using the PONS screening tool. And even better news, it's easily intervenable. Just seven days of a protein supplement can decrease perioperative morbidity by up to 50%. We also learned that immunonutrition is different than just a regular protein shake. It's specific in that it contains arginine and fatty acids and amino acids to improve surgical recovery. Um, it does this by promoting the microcirculation and improving blood flow, as well as strengthening your immune system to fight infection. Your patients will get out of the hospital about two days earlier. We explored a bit about vitamin C and how it might be a plausible treatment to reduce uh, acute postoperative pain by about 30%. And then lastly, vitamin D has many different roles other than calcium metabolism. So deficiency at the time of surgery is associated with significantly worse comorbidities, or sorry, morbidity, and that empiric supplementation preoperatively might be warranted to increase your patient, patient's physiologic reserves. And with that, we are done. And I would love to have a discussion um, to answer any of your questions and then also to talk about how, if you're at a different institution than Vanderbilt, how you are utilizing or screening for malnutrition or using immunonutrition or supplements in your own pre-op clinics. Excellent. Thank you, um, Brittany. So I'll just, uh, as always, I have uh, some questions and there's, uh, I see one from Jen in the chat and I've got some, but uh, anybody want to unmute and or turn on their video and uh, fire away uh, with a question? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Raymond. Hi, my name is Darna Shaw. I am from outside of Vanderbilt. I'm down in Little Rock, Arkansas at the University of Arkansas. And we are actually working on getting nutrition into the pre-operative period. And, uh, what was that process like in terms of implementing that into the perioperative clinic? That's a great question. So I will say that Dr. McAvoy can speak more heavily into what that looked like, as can Jen Jram. She was able to work with different surgical services to actually get bundles of immunonutrition drinks. I believe our contract is with Impact Advanced Recovery. Um, and actually, as the patient gets consented for surgery in surgery clinic, they exit the clinic with a week's worth of impact AR shakes at the time that they leave. Um, so like I said, I've actually never talked to a rep. I have not been in that process from the business side of things, but um, Jen or Dr. McAvoy, do you have any thoughts or to share on how you were able to get that? Um, sure. First off, uh, 
well, Jen, if you would want to uh, to talk, you're more than welcome to. Um, you need to have a Jen Jram who helps <laughs> push things through and is a tireless believer in uh, orthodontics, which is slow, constant pressure bringing about change. So um, we, what we didn't know, Jen, January of 2021, we found out about the VBA or February, something like that. Yeah, okay. It was it's definitely 2021. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say our experience is you go and put your pathway together. And because as, as uh, Dr. Raymond said, it's not covered by insurance, then you create a social a health disparity. And you have people that you say, hey, you need this bundle. It's about 80 bucks. There's some chlorhexidine wipes in it. There's the immunonutrition, et cetera. And uh, some people go, great, whatever. I've got cancer. I don't want an infection. All the data you saw. Then other people go, what? What am I not supposed to buy, right? And so there's a thing called a VBA, a value-based arrangement. And I'd be happy to share with you everything that our team has put together and big kudos to Jen on that over the years. But we had to put together an evidence base, um, define what populations we want it to apply to, set a target metric, which for us is um, days alive and out of hospital in the 30 days after surgery, because it has to be a patient relevant metric, not like, hey, the institution saved money, but it's important to patients to be home. And this is a carve out in a lot of the anti-kickback laws or that an inducement law that you're not, believe it or not, people think that if you give impact AR to patients, they're just going to sign up to have a colectomy or a Whipple or a whatever. And you're like, what? Well, trying to tell the attorneys, like it doesn't work that way, but sure. Um, so anyhow, we're about to launch with our first two services. It's been a lot of work. Um, we're hopeful to add another three to four to that soon. And then we're told by our attorneys that if we have positive uh, outcomes, that we can then just do an addendum and add on other services. So if you're going to do it, the screening, absolutely, all those things, work with nutrition on the inpatient side first to say, are patients getting this on their tray um, as a part of recovery? Because that, that budget's a little bit easier. And then I would say we found, uh, in fact, we had several clinics that quit doing nutrition altogether because they felt like it was really weird that they had to ask a patient to get out a credit card and clinic to be charged by them for something different. And that patients were almost looking at them like, "What? this is more weird than you giving me something and inducing me to have surgery, as, as people were saying. Um, so uh, that's sort of a lot of the mechanics of it. Um, and... And I think, and then we have worked with our pharmacy to package it all in a box. And starting soon, we'll be able to give a bottle of vitamin C, a bottle of vitamin D, basically about an eight week course, uh, seven days of pre-op immunonutrition, assuming they're here three to four days for major surgery. They, they then get four days of recovery nutrition inpatient and have three more days because it's a 10 day pack that they get when they go home. So I don't know if that answered your question or is way too much, but that's sort of the, the practical way that we do it. Yeah, I may reach, uh, I may reach out offline to ask a few more questions because I have a, a two year grant in order to implement this that's coming up in starting in January. So Dr. Raymond, your talks spot on and fantastic. So thank you. That's given me a lot of food for thought. So I'll reach out offline if that's okay. Absolutely. Hey, Brittany, I was hoping to ask a quick question. Um, first of all, excellent presentation as always. Um, I was just hoping to learn a little bit more about um, your practice in prescribing uh, Marinol. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, had a number of patients who are severely malnourished in the high rise clinic. And that's not something that um, I've done before, but I wonder if it's something that I could use if, if I had uh, a good subset of patients that um, would benefit from it. Um, so is there any way you could discuss like what subset of patients you think uh, uh, about prescribing Marinol, how you broach that subject, and what sort of counseling you give them around that medication? Um, great question. So I don't prescribe it for all. Um, I selectively use the patients that endorse having a poor appetite and having weight loss going into surgery. Um, and often I bring it up at the point where I'm talking to them about incorporating a nutrition shake three times a day. And it's that patient that goes, oh, I can, I don't even have an appetite. Like that's not going to work. That is my lead, like segue for me to say, well, what if I prescribed you an appetite stimulant? 
And then they're like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, well, it's a derivative of THC. Um, and for whatever reason, most of these patients actually like that. I think probably because they're excited about maybe not feeling as depressed or anxious about their cancer. They may be excited about what pain benefits they can get, which actually the data is not super great on anyway. But when I say THC, they kind of get excited like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll try that. I'll try that. Um, and even if they say that they're not open to it, I say, you know what, I'll write a prescription. And if you want to pick it up, great. If you don't want to, that's totally fine. Um, and then you're supposed to take it about one hour prior to meals. Um, and I, I start out at like two and a half, uh, twice a day and you can go up from there. Sorry. I, I think that last bit, um, and I can't remember if I got this from Brittany. I remember talking with her and also reached out to some of our Ankh folks because when I was like, I think this is a great thing. And I looked at it, then people said, Hey, warnings. If you start this in the elderly, you know, they might have some vivid dreams or whatever. And so that dose is really important. So starting at a low dose and what, um, I don't know if Brittany recommended it to me or the Ankh folks, but they said, start with 2.5 at night for a couple of days, if they do well, then, then take it in the morning. And, and there's probably a lot of ways to do this, but basically I think that idea of, um, starting low and slow and titrating over a few days is, um, has been my experience of what's, what really helps too. And most of them tell you they get the best sleep that they've had in years. And are there, sorry to ask one follow-up, uh, are there any like, um, issues with prescription um, in patients that are taking like opiates or um, I know you mentioned that it would come up positive on a drug test. If you were to, have you ever run into that where you have to like explain it to a pain doctor or um, are there any other sort of contraindications you think of? Yeah, because I do tell the patients that it will show up on a positive drug screen or will show up positive on a drug screen, the ones that have a contract with a pain clinic will say, oh, I can't do that then. Um, but the ones that don't have an existing pain contract, for the most part, they're either on disability with their cancer, they're not really working, so they don't really care or have a reason to be drug tested. And if it does come up, absolutely, they you know, can refer that person to look at my prescription and show that they, they have it. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, but I will say of all the medications that I have ever prescribed in high rise, whether it was a statin or amlodipine or even prescriptions for vitamin D and C when patients want prescriptions for it, the only one that has ever come back as people wanting refills, it's always Marinol. Like every couple months I have to reach out to them and be like, actually your PCP needs to do it now. I always get all these faxes in my mailbox of refills for Marinol. So somebody must like it. There you go. Okay, um, so we're past time, but Brittany, there's, I'm gonna do some rapid fire. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna try to force you to, to answer quickly. First off, I got an awesome presentation comment for you. Um, so question, how long would pre-op therapy be needed before seeing a therapeutic bump in vitamin D level? If you had to guess, what would you say right now? Two weeks. Okay. Uh, the vitamin C... Do, what, you have uh, to answer. I'm sure you know the answer. What is it? Uh, I, I don't know. And I think that that's oh, okay. something that we need to uh, look at as a group. Do you know the cost of the IV vitamin C? You talked about oral not being as beneficial. Do you know the cost of IV? I don't. You should have given me these questions ahead of time. I would have looked this up. Well, they're from different people. From Steph Barba, do you recommend, an, is there another score like the PONS that's often used? Yes, MST, malnutrition uh, screen test, I believe is what it's called, which I think the PONS is actually a derivative of, but the MST is also a very simple, easy one. I think it's endorsed by Aspen. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, anyone, have you ever seen any data on pro or prebiotics or gut microbiome supplements for wound healing and infection prevention perioperatively? I have actually had that discussion before, um, and I haven't looked at into it very seriously. Um, but I have had patients that I've seen in the high rise clinic that told me that they started taking a probiotic in preparation for their upcoming surgery. I just haven't done a, a literature review myself, but that is interesting. Something else I'm doing. And in the vitamin C study that you cited, um, were those patients uh, known to be vitamin C deficient or just super or just supplemented whether they were known to be deficient or not? Just supplemented. Awesome. 
Well, that was, as always, phenomenal presentation. Uh, we are recording these, and so um, we're working with our team to start to get these posted online. So you can take a look again if you want to. Uh, I'm always inspired to care more about nutrition after I hear this. Uh, I hope everybody has a great day.